call together. All right, we'll call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education to Community High School District 128 for Monday, August 24th to order. Um, we did a pledge earlier this evening, so I'll just ask for a roll call. Jim Batson. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Pat Grudy. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Kevin Huber. Here. Karen Lundstead. Here. Casey Rooney. Here. Okay, everybody is present. And before we get started, I'm also gonna take this opportunity. Actually, it's in the president's report, so I'll wait for it. Um, all right, everybody's here. Uh, I'll open it up for public comment. Mary, I believe there are a few comments for tonight's meeting. Actually, hold on one second. Uh, let me go through the agenda, I apologize. Um, we'll open it up for public comment, a uh, brief president's report, superintendent's report has a number of items on it, including school reopening, uh, capital projects updates. Uh, we'll approve the consent vote agenda, which we reviewed two weeks ago. Uh, brief updates from program and personnel and facilities and finance. Um, anything on CEDAW? Uh, where do I see Karen? No. Nope. Okay, nothing. Thanks, okay. Karen. And Jim, anything on ISB? Not tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So that'll be it. And then we will adjourn. All right. So now I'll open it up for public comment. Thanks, Mary. Okay. The, the first comment that we have is from a writer who wishes their name to be withheld. And her comment is, really? You are going to allow in-person classes for adults, but not for kids. They are the ones in they are the ones that need in-person learning the most. This district has gone nuts. If I could sell my house and move to another district, I would. Sadly, since we don't have in-person learning for kids, it is impossible to sell a house in this district. Um, the second comment comes from Ian Kazian. I would like to ask if the school district has created or is creating a task force to work on a framework for return to in-person learning. It would seem if the board is waiting for direction from the state, we may be waiting for a long time. Since there appears to be a lack of guidance on clear metrics for school boards to approve any type of in-person schooling, is the board looking to adopt other guidelines such as the ones presented by the Northern Illinois Public Health Consortium on August 14th? Is the district continuing to pursue procurement of the required ITAV equipment to provide the equitable live streaming learning environment as described in the July meeting? Overall, my question is, what is the board's formal plan or action to advance into the hybrid and hopefully in-person schooling in the future? And that's it. Okay. Can I ask one question if somebody, I don't know if somebody has the answer. How many people on a typical evening would be uh, in person in our um, continuing education programs? Um, Pat, I don't have a, a raw number, a total number, but the groups will be very small. As you know, and I'll discuss in my uh, school opening report, we're, we've already brought smaller groups of students in. We've got kids in athletics. We've got, so they'll be in very small groups. Uh, and they'll be following appropriate protocol uh, in community education. So uh, we have no concerns uh, with yeah. that. But, but Prentice, order of magnitude, is it uh, a couple dozen people on any given time, do you think, roughly? I don't know. I have no concept of this. I just want to, I mean, I, I want to make it clear to the public, the decision not to go, go open schools was, in, in some part anyway, based on the fact that we were, we were very concerned about the situation having upwards of a thousand or more people in the building at any one time. That's a very different situation, I think, than what we have on any given night on the continuing education, correct? That's correct. Very, okay, very so true. that anybody that thinks that we're valuing our continuation, our, our continuing education programs over our student education programs, I just want to state for the record that would be categorically incorrect. Um, and and it's, not, it's not really a fair assessment of, of what went into making the decision, okay? And second to the other one, Mary, there's more points on there than I can address, but I, I would say we have not finalized our, our uh, return to school plans. We continue to work on those efforts. We're gonna include all, all, all data inputs in making that decision. Um, stay tuned, I think we'll be providing 
more information as those plans develop, okay? Not the least of which we want to see how school openings are going in places where that's happened. Um, it certainly hasn't gone well in most of the college campuses. I think that is now a fact. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Okay. All right. Uh, President's report. All right. So tonight's and I want to welcome, we have a number of new faces um, on our uh, meeting tonight. And I'm going to try to introduce, I'll call you out and then you can speak up since none of us know who you are. Although I guess we can see, uh, see your name and your picture, but um, Amal Hassam. Hello, <laughs> I'm Amal. I'm all, I'm all, I'm all, when we, uh, when I call your name, why don't you just tell us which school you're at? Um, I know you're at LHS and uh, what year you're in. I get, or unless you guys are all, are you all seniors? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, you have the unprecedented, um, I'll call it position to be in a year like no other. You're, you're, uh, you're groundbreaking record breakers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right. So here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot really quickly then. I, I'd like you to make one comment about your first day back. Okay. Go ahead, Amal, we'll start with you. Uh, Pat, I think that's gonna be part of their report out tonight. Oh, okay, we can do it there. All right, that's fine, we'll do that. Okay, uh, Quinn uh, Kerland, is that right? Yeah, you said it right. Uh, okay, I'm hi Quinn. Bill. Okay, great, welcome. Uh, Marilyn, you? Here's Marilyn. All right, Marilyn, also a senior at LHS. And um, let's see, Diego Corrales Luce, Luce, is that right? I just go by Diego Corrales. Good evening. Diego Corrales, okay. Uh, Vernon Hills. Okay, great. Welcome, Diego. Um, Eva Atu, is that right? Hi, it's O2. And O2? I okay, great. Welcome, Eva. And uh, is it Kayla Rubin? Hi, I'm Kayla. I go to Vernon Hills High School. Hi, Kayla. All right, welcome to all you guys. We were just thrilled to death to have you. And, uh, we're gonna really, really, really look forward. To, we always look forward to the student input, um, but never more so than now. I think your input's really valuable to us. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Okay, um, otherwise, listen, I just wanna say thanks to everybody. Um, I know we've received some emails on uh, a lot of the preparations that have been done over the last couple of weeks, getting ready for uh, the virtual opening. I just want to say thanks to everybody that was involved in that, all of the, everybody in the administration, all of the teachers, um, all the supporting staff. I, I can only imagine what it's been like um, to get this together. I was extremely inspired, uh, inspired by um, some of the feedback we got on the preparation sessions. And, uh, you know, again, just thanks so much for all the very, very hard work. Um, to pull it off. It sounds like people are very engaged and very motivated. Um, I'm excited to hear more about um, our opening today. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it to Dr. Lee um, for his superintendent's report. Uh, Pat, do we want to do the board reps first? Uh, we can. Want to have them report out? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do that. So why don't you all take uh, a turn? I know you've, you've probably networked with each other a little bit and then uh, maybe we can go LHS and then VHHS and just talk about uh, kind of the run up to the start of the school and your first day today and anything else you wanna talk about. Okay, I'll start. Um, so although today mostly included the syllabus and icebreaker activities, I took the I think we lost them all. Amal, can you hear us? I think we lost you, your video, your audio. Should I start over? Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm sorry. No problem. It's okay. Okay, three, two. <laughs> Although today mostly included the syllabus and icebreaker activities, I took the time today to reach out to many students asking about their e-school experience. Here are what many enjoyed about e-school. They enjoyed the long break given to them so that they can step back from their computers and like eat something or just take a break from screen time. They also liked the designated idea of, t of office hours so that they have the option to meet with the teacher and not feel like it's forced. And um, 
a student loved how their teacher that day taught for a specific number of minutes, then gave them 15 minute individual work time that allowed them to turn their cameras off and just do the work that was given to them. And then after they would come back together and discuss their answers, um, that was most benefit. Like everyone who's come out of that class today said that that was most beneficial and felt like the most normal to them. So the concerns about eSchool that I've mainly heard, the biggest one is the focusing issue. Um, some students felt as though they lost focus in the middle of the Zoom, Zoom call and by fourth period, which is the last period of the, of like the block schedule, um, they all felt burnt out so they didn't pay attention that period. Um, they felt as though there needs to be more of a stimulus aspect to wake them up and to actually do something. And they felt like teachers were too broad with direction and that they needed to be more specific with what they wanted so that there is less room for confusion and interpretation. They hope that in the upcoming weeks, weeks, teachers become more organized and use activities that are beneficial rather than time fillers. So my personal thoughts is eSchool today went better than I was expecting, but I'm still hoping this week is more about teachers learning about their students so that they can understand their personality and develop that teacher-student um, connection. Um, and I, well, today I was scared to participate because when I try to, um, for example, I was spoken over and my answer wasn't acknowledged. So that's what a lot of students do feel like that participation being lower, lower than normal ha um, because of the anxiety of maybe like, for example, like cutting off or just like the awkwardness of speaking in front of virtual classmates that you've never spoken in front of before. So yeah. Okay, great. Good. Good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can talk about my day a little bit. So um, like them all talked about, um, what re worked really well for me was a blocked out time for us to work by ourselves where the teachers would say, all right, guys, you have 15 minutes to read these couple of pages. Why don't you go ahead, turn off your mics, turn off your cameras, and then we'll regroup. And I thought that was uh, really beneficial just because I could kind of work on my own pace for a little bit and kind of get acclimated. And then um, one concern I had was in gym, they're really pushing for getting outside and being active, which I super, really support. And I think it's really important. Um, but they wanted to block off the time during the period where you have to do your physical activity. And I like to jog and run in the mornings. And they said that like didn't jive with the schedule and that they'd prefer if we ran or, you know, exercise during the time of gym. So just something to think about. Uh, Mar let's see, Marilyn. Marilyn. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, my thoughts on eSchool today, I agree with them all in that I feel like students are more hesitant to raise their hands in class because they're afraid of either their audio not connecting or just like the awkwardness like of just talking randomly. And I think that one positive was the Zoom breakout rooms because although awkward at first, they allow you to connect with smaller groups of students and they allow you to talk kind of not like you would in class because a lot of students are just scared to talk in class. So I think that was a positive. Okay, very good. Thanks for your feedback. Uh, Vernon Hills. To start off, I thought my first day of school was pretty successful. I had subtle connection issues and my teachers were quick to communicate with us to let us know if we were using Google Meet or Zoom. I was able to follow the schedule and make it to all my classes on time and I thought my teachers did a great job utilizing Zoom to communicate with us and Google Classroom to release information and material. Shout out to my AP Psych teacher Mr. Mann for incorporating fun Zoom activities. To great. continue, um, last week Vernon Hills had a freshman orientation which was a two-day four-session event. Four sessions were incorporated in order for students to remain socially distanced. Each session started off with freshmen heading to an assigned classroom where they met their orientation leaders. The leaders then went over material given to the freshman class, such as available resources and how to access them, policies and guidelines, and told them about what to expect from school culture. Leaders highlighted and explained that new e-school schedule and how Zoom classes would work. They graciously answered and any of the freshmen had to ask, all while striving to emphasize what makes Vernon Hills High School Vernon Hills High School. To continue the day, the freshmen were taken to the auditorium for a presentation by Dr. G and Dr. Young. After this presentation, they were taken on tour, received their textbooks, took their yearbook photo, and had an informative <clears> session <throat> with the counselor. Freshman Garrett Rubin even said that he felt very informed. During the past week, Vernon Hills High School also gave students the opportunity to take their yearbook photos and pick up textbooks. Student groups were divided by last name, and each section had a specific time period to come to school. Welcoming students 
safely back into the building required Vernon Hills to take several safety precautions in order to follow social distancing guidelines and safety protocols. Upon walking into the building, there's a camera that takes your temperature and staff members who are there to monitor. In order to enter, you must be wearing a mask and only take it off to take your yearbook photo. For their lines, arrows and X's demonstrating which direction to move in and where to stand in order to remain socially distanced. Overall, many students said they felt safe and cared for by Vernon Hills High School. Various school staff said that they're glad to have students back into the building and that it was to see everyone's face. The VHHS LST and cafeteria team continues to provide lunches to students in need. Even though our cafeteria is still under construction, Chef Vina goes to LHS to prepare the food. Our LST staff delivers the meals for families that cannot get to school to pick it up. The school is still accepting donations from the community for supplies and food for our most challenged families. Please bring in food and supplies and drop them off at Dort's number two. A special shout out of appreciation goes to sophomore Jaden Rush. Jaden and her family brought bags of new school supplies that are intended for families in need. The LST will be giving these out to Vernon Hills High School families in the coming days. And a special thanks to our driver's ed teachers, Mr. A well, Mr. Compton, Mr. Morello, and Mr. DeLuca. Last spring, they were unable to get student driving time to finish the behind the wheel portion of driver's ed. This summer, they gave up their personal time to develop and implement a plan that got almost all the students the needed hours. This semester is seeing another difficulty in driver's ed because we are all remote practice driving in the cars unless the teachers are willing to come in and drive with students. All our teachers are ready and willing and they will start bringing students to school to drive as soon as driver's permits are secured. To continue to athletics, sports teams are seeing different participation rates this year. For example, our cross country team is down a bit in participation numbers from what school officials have heard. Several athletes have decided not to participate due to We can't hear you, Ava. I don't know if that's the case for everyone else. That's true. Kayla or Diego, why don't you, uh, oh, there's Eva. Can you hear me? We can yeah. now. Yeah. Eva, go back to your, after cross country, we, you cut out. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So, sports teams are seeing different participation rates this year. For example, our cross country team is down a bit in participation numbers. From what school officials have heard, several athletes have decided not to participate due to fear of COVID infections. On the other hand, tennis has seen a spike in the number of girls trying out. In what is normally a cut sport, Coach Gerber has decided to give all athletes a spot on the team so that as many as possible can benefit from getting outside, being a member of a team, and competing against area schools. Head soccer coach Mr. McCallu reports that he and his boys' teams are devastated that the season has been temporarily canceled. While they are pleased that the season has been moved to spring, they had been preparing for a successful fall. The coach was excited to report that many of his players have decided to run on crop on the cross-country team instead to keep in shape during this offseason. Coach McCallie points out that these players may be the first four sport athletes Vernon Hills High School has ever had. Busing at Vernon Hills High School has begun. We have surveyed our families and there are roughly a dozen current athletes that need rides to school to and from practices. School administrators have worked with our bus company to develop routes for these students. Buses for drivers and students who need rides will begin next week. Great, thank you, Eva. And uh, I'm just gonna pick up where she left off with some overall info from the IHSA. So the season length, I'm sure, as everyone's already been informed on, is August 10th to October 24th for this fall. IHSA bylaws will not be barring schools who will be in remote learning from being involved in IHSA sports, which doesn't necessarily affect us. And an extension has been laid out for allowing an additional 20 contact days for sports set in winter, spring, or summer. So that gives them extra prep time to be more competitive with their seasons. And these extra 20 contact days are going to be pretty flexible between September 7th and October 31st. But they have to be, and they're going to be really strict in enforcing the fact that they're going to be following the Illinois Department of Health and Public, or the De Illinois Department of Public Health regulations regarding those 20 contact days. Now jumping more in detail into the sports, girls tennis, the team started off strong. They tied a tough Grays Lake Central team on Thursday and then beat Wakanda 7-0 the next day. This week, Cesar Cougars played four matches in four days, which should be brutal. Girls swim and dive. This year, the girls swim, in, the girls swim team had a lot of freshmen who came to try out and many returning swimmers. Vernon Hills swimmers are currently training at that Lir Libertyville facility due to the construction at VH. During swim practice, there are two swimmers per lane and they start on opposite ends of the pool. So there's only interaction when they swim past each other and swim meets are also going to be held virtually. Each school swims in their own pool and each swimmer is timed. Uh, senior Naomi Hernandez said that swimming is still fun, but obviously isn't the same since everyone is separated and split up. Specifically about cross country, I reached out to the coach, Adam Lucan, head coach, and he's also the top dog for computer science instruction at Vernon Hills. He told me a lot of good things. He's noticed great 
And that's even including the change in numbers that Eva mentioned. He said he's noticed a great change in tone compared to other seasons in terms of gratitude. His athletes are just happy to have a season and be able to participate in their sports. He specifically mentioned that attendance at, for training as early as 6.30 a.m. has been stellar and there have been zero complaints. And that's coming from cross-country runners who voluntarily run over 100 miles a summer. Lucan also says that they're making small changes to cross-country traditions, such as changing ultimate Frisbee on Thursdays and replacing them with fast bike races. I'm sure other sports are doing similar things as well within their um, team culture, which is really good to see. He also wanted me to specifically shout out his dedicated captains, Oscar Jedinak, Ian Joe, Michael Lee, and Alex Yusis, who I know for a fact are all very, very strong runners. Now, in terms of golf, a final sport we're going to be talking about, the, golf, uh, the girls' golf team's first tournament of the season was the Libertyville High School invite. Vernon Hills had the best team score since 2017 with a 353. Uh, golfers Lexi won six tournaments with an even par round of 71, Anna 84, Mira 90, and Nitya 108. The girls' golf team's experience of surge in numbers is mentioned already and many players who came to try out. During practice, all players are required to wear masks and all players practice together unless varsity has a tournament. Senior J.D. Gillard said that overall, everyone is excited that golf will be having a season because it's one of the few sports that can. And moving on more specifically to clubs, I'm gonna be talking about uh, future business leaders of America and JSA, two clubs I have experience with and I think are Titan clubs at our school. As you may recall, FBLA ran their senior competition or their state competition virtually this year and a number of students chose to participate despite the switch to virtual and qualified and moved on to nationals. FBLA reconstructed their usual national leader con conference into a virtual national leadership experience and our qualifiers moved on to compete there. And we just received notification of those results which can be viewed in this document if anyone's interested, um, which is actually the document I'm looking at right now. Just a bunch of kids from our school placed highly. I see everything above ninth place and a few top five and top two places as well. Now, I also specifically reached out to our FBLA executive board to see what they were gonna be doing for this fall. FBLA President Eric Song and Vice President Arya Panda said they tried, they are gonna to try to start meeting in September fully on Zoom, usually following a presentation format. Luckily, not much interaction between their exec board and members is needed till later in the year, and that's even in regular non-virtual years. So they're confident that that can be done well through breakout rooms, which they've already tested. Freshman interest seems high enough with abnormally high numbers uh, from last year's eighth grade orientation. So they're very excited about that. And in terms of competition, FBLA and higher ups in that organization haven't given them any NFL. Now in terms of JSA, which I'm really active in myself, numerous JSA Midwest and national conventions and workshops were held over Zoom, Zoom last spring. And I was there and they were a great success and throughout the summer as well. CabCon, a popular convention just passes this previous Saturday morning, which was great. Fall State, our biggest convention of the fall semester, will be online and not at the Madison Capitol building, but spirits are still high for the debates and awesome keynote speakers we have lined up. JSA Exec Board has worked diligently to set up an Instagram account, launch a website, and send consistent updates regarding webinars, events, and overall supports all members. We had a trial meeting over Zoom with already existing members who have been in the club last week, and that was a great success. It went super smoothly. We have an official first meeting date for September 7th, and our primary debate being a debate on resolved, the American police should be defunded. Now in terms, and I'm gonna tie up with orchestra and fine arts in terms of the strings program, but overall across the board, there are options, software options such as Music First Classroom, which I logged in and had fun with today, Acapella app, Google Classroom, and uh, Soundtrap and multiple other programs, if anyone's familiar with music making programs such as Studio One and the Adobe Suite. All this stuff basically allows for that to be done in a way similar to Google Docs, where it's collaborative across a whole 70 to 100 person ensemble. So in theory, it should be working out really well. And there's talk about chamber groups, quartets, trios, octets, meeting up regularly and in person, but that's still in the works. Okay, great job. Kayla. Oh, I just want to first apologize. We started, sorry if we like messed up the order or something. No, no, say. it's great. No, no, you're good. No, no it's great. Good. It's all great. Okay, okay. So I'll just start now. Thank you. Clubs in general. Many clubs in general have made Google Classroom and Zoom links to get new students and old students involved. More specifically, the following. BHGIV has made letters to each You cut off. Maybe. Kayla, are you still there? Yes. Can, okay, I'm just uh, start at the VH Give part. Okay. VH Give has made letters to each VH Give leader and sent them in the mail along with the VH Give logos mask. VH Give has also started planning out the year with our theme, Better Well Done Than Well Said. And the executive board has worked hard all summer. 
don't know. Rose and Kayla. Is everything good still? Uh, go back to worked hard. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Just take your just take your time. It's fine. It's not your fault. Um, we were also planning on having some seminars to educate our community on climate change and plastic pollution for environmental club. And the exec board has worked hard all summer and is a seminar planned for this week. The first day of school. So we started the day with a nationwide Zoom crash in a highly populated area. Chicago land was hit hard. The district saw over 150 teachers quickly switch to Google Meets for their first meetings of the year. While my first day of school was an experience if I say so myself, I started my day with a Google Meet for VH Give Exec Board, which went smoothly. It gave me hopes that the rest of the day would run as smoothly, but that was not the case. My first period class teacher only posted a Zoom link, which worked for everyone in the class except for me. Next, that emailed and called my counselor, which really helped, but nothing worked to actually get to actually get me into the class. I reached out to a classmate via social media who was able to help me figure out what to do. Second period came around and nothing worked, but another teacher suggested that I was to use a Zoom app, Zoom app on my phone. So it worked well for the rest of the day. It All right, hold on, Kayla. Ms. Zorowski, who gave me her perspective of her first day at school. Ms. Zorowski had a similar day as I did. Um, I, her first class, second period, was not working whatsoever. She used both Google Meet and Zoom to try and, and set up a meeting, but that did not work. And she also said that there was a landscape company working at the front of her house. She took her house, which is fun. Then she finally got into the Zoom late and the breakout rooms wouldn't work. She said that Wednesday will be a perfect redo opportunity in hopes that she can get through to her class activities and that a Zoom will work. Third period came around and she told me that she felt like she was able to actually relax and be herself because everything went smoothly. Finally, we spoke again during fourth period, which is both of our lunch periods. And she told me that in the beginning, she felt stressed and shaky, but it ended on a high note. Construction. Construction over the period of time known as quarantine. Construction of VHHS has continued to progress. Upon entering the building, door number two has become the main entrance. In order to commemorate graduated senior class, Dr. G made a mur mural, sorry, mural on the wall of the cafeteria with each of the graduated seniors' names, which has been painted over. Dr. G also painted the class of 2020 on the new gym edition that too has been painted over and ready for brick. Student Eva O2 was able to view the cafeteria and said that it's much light, larger and high end. Many students that passed by stated that they liked their new cafeteria. Construction of the cafeteria as well as the dance studio is nearly finished. The catwalk from the UC to the new dance facility is complete and the new institutional wing with has Kayla, you still there? I'm, oh, I was just saying thank you for this opportunity. Okay. Hey, do me a favor. Go back to the catwalk part and tell us what came after that. Okay. The catwalk from the UC to the new dance facility is complete. The new instructional wing has corridors leading all to, the, to all classrooms on each level. Many of the science spaces are delayed due to COVID-19 shutting down, as many of the manufacturing plants are shut down. Thank you for this opportunity and we're all very excited to work with everyone this school year. All right, great job everybody. And you know, I, I thanked all the teachers, the administration, all the people behind the scenes trying to put all the programs together. But I, I also wanna say a special thanks to all you students who are working so hard to make this work. 
And, and I know it's not easy. I know it's what, not what you planned for, but I really appreciate everything you're doing to make it work. Um, and, and I know, uh, you know, your dedication and commitment going forward are just critical to the success of the whole thing over the next couple of months. So thanks for everything you're doing. Um, We'd like to, to apologize work. as VHS. Yeah, I think LHS students have uh, their report. Yeah. <laughs> kind of oh, I'm off. sorry. Did I? You asked us about our school days and we just gave you our full report and we didn't give Liberty Bill a chance to do that. So. Yeah, my, yeah, no, my, I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. So who wants to start? Right. I think a mall's picking up at Stuco. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. La All right. Last week, Student Council Executive board, board organized and distributed sphere packs. Freshmen received their student wing crew, while sophomores, juniors, and seniors picked theirs up during textbook pickup. Although football games aren't happening right now, we hope we can still show our school spirit through another outlet. The web store reopened to give students another chance to purchase a spear pack. Officially, the voted homecoming theme for 2020 to 2021 is Elva under the big top, carnival theme. Stay tuned while Stuco Exec figures out another way to keep the tradition of unity and standing together during these times. During the past couple of weeks, students were able to come to school and to drop off and pick up their textbooks and take their yearbook picture. Students were split into groups, each given a different textbook or um, drop off slash pickup time. The 15 minutes of being back in school, walking the familiar hallways, seeing the security guards who greeted them like before COVID, and letting kids with hope and put, put so many smiles on their faces. On August 5th and August 6th, Dr. K and other staff members hosted a webinar speaking to each grade level. During the senior webinar, webinar students were comforted by Ms. Belstra. CRC counselor about our current situation in regards to standardized testing. Many seniors recently have been feeling the stress of college. Some haven't taken an SAT or ACT yet, or ACT test yet before and now only have one shot and others don't feel like they have enough time to improve their score. Many are also on edge waiting to see if their test center, test center will cancel their test or not. However, many seniors were eased by what Ms. Belcher had to say and we're given hope by Dr. K about senior year events. Freshman orientation occurred August 20th and August 21st in a safe manner. Students were split into groups by lunch periods and were able to meet their link crew members and leaders. The students met on the football field socially distanced where they were given a warm welcome to their home for the next four years. Students received their gym uniforms, Chromebooks, and took their yearbook pictures before splitting into their many, many link crew groups. Students are looking forward to begin meeting with their clubs virtually and hope to meet in person soon. Best Buddies is putting a huge emphasis on their peer buddy program, where a club member is paired with another member who has a disability. Although right now their meeting will occur virtually, they are hoping each individual can meet with another in individual, of course following protocol to keep the connection between each student. President of Best Buddies, Mia Vernasco, attended, attended the virtual Best Buddies training conference over the summer. She had the chance of meeting with other presidents virtually and talk to the state about their options this year as a club. They learned about the dis disability civil rights movement and public speaking. Drops, Drops of Ink, LHS's school magazine, has been very active since the beginning of summer. Senior Ella Marston wrote a column about the political climate of the time, Black Lives Matter, and, and protests. Recently, Doi reached out to students, teachers, and community members about their reaction to the e-school decision and published them on the Doi website. This upcoming school year, DOI is playing a bigger role than ever, as many students will turn to DOI for important information. There will be a huge emphasis on the Drops of Ink website where the magazines will be, will be published and more columns will be written. All right, nice job. Who's next? Uh, I'm going with uh, athletics and wellness. So Diego already talked about most a lot of the points, but um, – we know due to IHSA rules, some of the sports have been postponed, but we still have some sports that are going on now. We got boys golf, cross country, girls swimming and diving, and girls tennis. Uh, these sports have been training for about two weeks, and we've had a lot of success with the teams, but there's also a lot of different accommodations that we have to follow with COVID. Um, the golf team has already had two matches, and accommodations include wearing masks unless hitting the ball and avoiding bus rides to matches and practices. The cross-country team has also been training using social distancing, and they have their first race this Wednesday. Meets are held with runners running spaced out and starting every 15 seconds, and all big invites are canceled, leaving just uh, dual meets between two schools. Um, girls tennis also has their first match Wednesday, and they'll play without spectators and with gloves on to avoid touching the ball directly. 
girls swimming and diving competes with masks while on deck and they're in the pool, but unfortunately they have canceled all relay meets. Um, they are prohibited from using the bathrooms and locker rooms as to avoid uh, being close with each other indoors. Uh, additionally, sports that are tra transitioning to the spring from the fall um, are football, boys soccer, and girls volleyball. And uh, as a student athlete that participates in soccer, I'm actually pretty happy with this decision because I would much rather have a full and complete season in the fall than kind of a 50-50 back in the, full and complete season in the spring than being kind of back in the fall. Um, although we'll not have the season, many coaches are trying to find ways to connect with the players this fall. Uh, teams are allowed 20 contact days, but dates and times are still being finalized. And additionally, virtual workouts Monday through Friday are open to all student athletes at either 7 a.m. or 3.45 p.m. By, led by the athletic department. Uh, NHS scheduled for August 27th has been postponed and a virtual ceremony is being planned and announced in the next couple weeks. And the NHS exec board is also working very hard to uh, virtualize or make or to plan their first virtual meeting. Um, on health and wellness this year is presenting new difficulties and obstacles that we have never encountered in the past. For this reason, to keep us healthy and connected, wellness events such as Life of a Wildcat, Green Dot, and Wellness Weeks will all be continued throughout the year. Dr. Nelson is working very hard to connect students between grades and in a, and in a diverse population as well as she can. That's it for me. Okay. Hey, Quinn, you might have just coined a new term. I like that, virtualize. That uh, You kind of said it by accident, but I, I think you just invented the verb of the year. We're going to virtualize this. We're going to virtualize that. So good word. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Mar Mar Maryland. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about the Fine Arts Department. So I was able to reach out to the Fine Arts Department, and I received information about plans and concerns regarding the upcoming school year. And the teachers were able to give me so much information and I was very impressed by how much they had thought through. And I can't present all the details tonight, but I can run through some of them. So the music department received approval to continue drumline rehearsals for the fall. And although football has been moved to March and April, drumline is still used throughout the year and they have continued rehearsals as of last week. Um, they welcomed the freshmen at their orientation and they plan to begin a regular Tuesday night rehearsal through the end of October with proper social distancing and screening guidelines. On August 11th, the music department also received approval to move ahead with a scaled down band camp model and preparations for performances in the spring football season. No instrument playing was done at these sessions, but they were instead focused on marching fundamentals, goal setting, and social emotional development. On Thursday, non-perishable food items were collected for Libertyville area families in need through the LHS food pantry and other local food pantries. And since concerts with live audiences are not possible this semester, choir, band, and orchestra performances are being designed to be broadcast or released as audio albums. And personally, as a senior in one ensemble, I know performances like the Senior Concerto Competition winner means a lot to the whole band and especially the participants because they spend so long practicing throughout the year. And I hope that we can still have the competition in some way. Another big concern of band students in general is missing the connection of being in person together and making music. Since we're an ensemble, we're missing that ensemble component. So we have to come up with ways to bridge that gap. And efforts are also being made to advance extracurricular ensembles in accordance with district policies, including marching wildcats, jazz bands, pit orchestra, spring, string project, and acapella choirs. As for art, in the 2D classes, art kits will be sent home so the students will all have the supplies necessary to complete projects. And the projects are not necessarily being reduced or modified. The same approach we have used for years is the way they're going to go about teaching art in a virtual environment. There will be many in progress grades and individual critiques through breakout rooms and Zoom. And Padlet will also be used to post work and to see work of other students in class. Where it gets challenging are the classes that need certain facilities, tools, and supplies. For example, darkroom photography is hard to teach virtually as everyone does not have a lab for processing photographs at home. And that's where students returning to school to use the dark room to develop and produce their photographs comes in. Uh, all the art classes need the flexibility of students to be able to come in and actually work on their own artwork in the art department studios. They also hope to offer the 3D darkroom photography and glass art students an on-campus experience in some capacity as soon as it is safely possible. Students will be given materials and tools to construct projects at home. However, this may present an inequitable situation as some students do not have the luxury of setting up a dedicated studio space to create art. 
And this coming week, as we meet with our art students, we hope to continue to problem solve and generate creative ideas that successfully address challenges of a remote art learning environment. For dance, the following statements have been provided by the dance instructor of LHS, Mrs. Brown. I will produce and share tutorial videos of my class content on our Google Classroom as they can rewatch our combinations in the semi-synchronous setting or for extra practice after class. This allows for control over pacing and to perform as many repetitions as needed during your individual sessions. The physical welfare department has acquired an auto follow camera called a PIXM that I will use to record my videos. I will wear a sensor wristband and then the camera will track my every move no matter where I am in the room. We will also be able to replicate the in-class performances that are a regular part of the dance curriculum. Lastly, theater. For theater courses, kinetic movement and theater technique is taught primarily through acting exercises and theater games. And instead of going on field trips to Chicago Shakespeare and North Light Theater, guest artists will be brought in to complete a masterclass and offer performance for our students via Zoom, while also using examples from recorded performances for our class critiques. Students will also be doing practical theater design units, including theatrical makeup, scenic design, and making props. And for this fall, our extracurricular fall play will be written and adapted by Mr. Thomas, who is creating a drive-through theater experience, including performances of 12 two-person scenes in the LHS parking lot where audiences will drive up to watch each progressive scene. Um, actors will be masked and socially distanced, and each scene will be double cast so that students will tag team the performance for each new car audience. And that concludes LHS student report. And I just wanna say on behalf of Amal Quinn and I, we would like to thank the board for allowing us to participate in the back to school task force meetings this summer and for listening to our opinions in general. And we're all very excited to be working together with the board this year. Thank you. All right, well, thanks again for all, for all your hard work. It's, it's incredibly inspiring to hear your stories and, and frankly, hard to believe that schools just open with everything you just reported. So uh, simply amazing. All right, thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. Okay, with that said, now we can move to uh, superintendent's report. Pat, if it's okay, um, I'm going to uh, just kind of continue with school reopening and then I'll pick up good news sure. after that. Because yep. yep. I want to go to Tom and John and see if they want to make any comments on uh, um, maybe beyond or in addition to uh, what the students had to add. So, uh, John, um, anything to add to the students? We'll start with you and then we'll go to Tom. Yeah, thanks, Prentice. Thanks, uh, you board reps. You did a nice job there. That was... Uh... It was a great report. I, you know, they've said a lot. I think I would uh, summarize my kind of reflections on day one in two ways. One is relieved. Uh, it just seems like so much energy, uh, resource, uh, planning has gone into really creating new systems all across the district. So to, to get it launched uh, and in a positive way, even with the glitch this morning with Zoom crashing on us, uh, you know, I, I was just relieved to see it get off the ground. Uh, and then the second word I'd say is grateful, uh, especially grateful for the support that we have got as a district, starting with you and the board as the board. Um, but then just, you know, our IT support, our, our facilities support, it's just been uh, unbelievable. And then just grateful for the professionalism of our, our staff and teachers. Uh, I have my own daughter who I kind of picked her brain a little bit tonight just about her experience. Uh, and I think, you know, Prentice promised uh, the community that we would do this e-school uh, second to none. And I feel like we, we're headed in the right direction. Today was a great day. As the, the kids said, it wasn't perfect, but we knew it wouldn't be. Um, but it was it was positive in almost every aspect that I was hoping for, uh, and so I'm just grateful. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and I think it was a very uh, similar experience at Libertyville. Um, we had uh, quite a few teachers in the building today, um, and I was able to walk around and check in with many of them, and um, overwhelmingly to a person, they were they were very positive and excited felt um, that, you know, you cannot underestimate how important those last two weeks of staff development and staff learning were. Um, the, the support by the board to um, help us make that happen is going to be something that I think uh, when we are as successful as we will be with eSchool, we're, we're going to point to those two weeks and say that was really one of the critical factors um, because it was such a unifying, awesome week 
at two weeks of learning where it wasn't just Libertyville staff in one building and Vernon Hills staff in the other. It was the whole district coming together for these really just outstanding um, learning experiences and dialogue and discussion. And I think that's why today when Zoom hit the ground and you know, it was like, of course, we're, we're coming into school and we're finding out about this massive outage on the very first day. Like, you know, there, there was a little bit of panic, but there was also an ability for everybody to be nimble and pivot. And part of that was because they were, they were prepared and trained in different uh, platforms and different ways of doing this. Um, and, you know, it just shows that um, our staff when given the time, the resources um, will take it very seriously, will work on their skills and be ready to bring it for the students uh, no matter what happens. Um, the other thing I would add is I, I am very proud like John is of our start, um, but I think we are all feeling that um, there is just a mountain of unanswered questions in front of us. Um, you know, it is, and you as a board are feeling those too, right? There, we are taking our entire school system, and as Quinn said, we're virtualizing it. And, you know, we've done an intensive focus on these, on the classroom, which is where our focus needed to be. But we also, you know, now have to turn our attention to all the other aspects of the school that families depend on and that students depend on. And so, um, we're going to start tackling those things and we're going to start working through it. And um, I can get overwhelmed by the thought of all of this as a principal, but I think there's two things that, I'm, that are it, it inspiring me and, and, and kind of motivating me. And I think you as a board should be aware of that. And the first is like you heard the, in the student reports, so many of the teachers were saying to the kids, hey, let's work together on this let's try to figure this out together. And, and I think that's really awesome that there's this collaborative sense between parents and students and staff and administration and the board to say, we're all in this same, you know, situation. Um, none of us have been here before. None of us have the answers. So let's really partner with one another and look for good ideas wherever they come from. And the other thing that I think was happening towards the end of last week was not only were we looking to solve problems to get us back to how we can do, you know, good quality instruction, but a lot of the staff has started to really think about how is this an opportunity to truly innovate and redesign schools so that when we come back to school in, you know, in person and on campus, we've um, developed some new systems and we've pushed some systems forward that are ultimately gonna be beneficial for students in ways uh, that we weren't able to do before or that we just didn't have the time to innovate on before. Um, and I've talked about that a few times this summer, but I saw a real kind of spark in people's eyes and a real kind of understanding like, hey, not only are we creating this model um, for now, for the short term, but some of this stuff we're doing, this could be really good for a long time to come. And I'm excited to see how that unfolds moving forward. Um, we're gonna have our challenges. There's gonna be a lot of ups and downs with this, uh, but with the attitude of our students and the tenacity of our staff, I know we're gonna get through it. Great, thanks, Tom. Okay, um, well, I'll just add a few things to this and then we'll move back um, into uh, good news and uh, we'll move through my report. Um, I want to start by adding my thanks uh, to um, several um, folks and groups of folks. First, starting with the board. Um, you've heard tonight, uh, you've also received a few emails from teachers, uh, and we've received many more that weren't sent directly to you um, that express their appreciation and the importance of the two weeks of preparation time. And what it's, what's really important to be underscored here is the teaching and learning that went on during that period of time was with and among our own staff members. Okay, we had trainers of trainers. We had our own staff teaching and sharing with other staff members. It was very, very powerful. But I think what you've heard consistently from the staff that that second week really made a difference 
when our teachers, who have teachers as friends uh, in other districts, um, compared notes, uh, they really felt that second week was very um, important and very powerful for us to be ready uh, to hit the ground running this morning. So we want to thank the board uh, for their willingness um, uh, to provide that two weeks and then uh, know that um, our staff not only used that very effectively, but they valued that and really felt that that helped them pre be prepared uh, for uh, this morning when the students return. I want to thank the administrators, uh, the district leadership team, Tom uh, and John and their uh, building teams as well. Uh, Tom hit on this a little bit, but, um, and Pat heard me say this on opening day, we are recreating 120 years of built upon knowledge in terms of opening and conducting public schools in this country. And we did that virtually over the summer. And so the work that uh, the leadership teams here uh, have done uh, has been nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, it's been a lot of six and seven day weeks, a lot of 12 and 14 hour days um, that um, you know, we gladly uh, did work to prepare for this day um, moving forward, but leadership matters. And um, that has never been more underscored than it has been over the past several weeks of the summer. So thanks to the leadership team in the district, of course, our teachers and support staff, if you already heard, uh, uh, really uh, done an incredible job. And they've really taken to uh, and exhibited a can-do attitude um, during this and also expressing that we've got this to the students and working with the students. Uh, and everything is about context and inflection and how people choose um, to uh, deal with a very challenging situation. And um, we, you know, we're very proud of our teachers and our support staff. And then of course, we wanna thank our parents uh, and our amazing students for their patience as we work through this process to you know, get to the point um, you know, that we're at right now. So um, you know, with that, I'm gonna repeat again what I've said on July 22nd. And that is by the end of the year, we will be at the apex of high schools in this country that do remote learning. Uh, and we're well on the, uh, our way to the path because that's who we are as a district. And that's embodied by uh, our collective staff in the district. So uh, we're really excited uh, about jumping off. Um, and um, it will require patience as Tom has indicated. And I think John, uh, there are gonna be questions that we have to answer as we go. We'll answer those questions. We'll apply that to what we're doing and we'll get better at what we're doing every single day uh, through the course of the school year. So thanks to everyone uh, for that. Um, okay, good news. Uh, this summer, LHS students competed in the virtual national FBLA conference. Team member Desi Nainer placed fifth in business calculations. The team is coached by Loretta O'Day and Kevin Garrell. LHS, chemi LHS chemistry teacher Sherry Rooks was one of 53 individuals honored by the American Chemical Society as being named to the 2020 class of ACS fellows. Created by the ACS Board of Directors in December 2008, the Fellow of the American Chemical Society designation is awarded to members who in some capacity have made exceptional contributions to the science or profession and have provided excellent volunteer service to the ACS community. And the LHS Wildcats, uh, Marching Wildcats hosted its annual band camp. I think one of the students mentioned that earlier. Students collected over 700 food donations to fill the LHS food pantry. In addition, the drum line performed for freshman orientation and demonstrated to a true Wildcat uh, pride. So congratulations and thanks to everyone. And now for a uh, capital projects update, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dan and Mark, or Mark and Dan. Who's ever going to go first here? Okay, I will go first. Um, on our uh, summer capital projects, um, we still have some ongoing work at LHS. Um, we're finishing up the tuck pointing uh, project, and we're finishing up on the roofing. Um, our tennis courts were delayed uh, 
we inspected the service, the surface, and we were not happy with the finish of the tennis courts. Uh, unfortunately, when the um, subcontractor put in the uh, posts for the uh, tennis nets, uh, they had a hard uh, tire piece of equipment um, that uh, left marks and grooves in the surface. Uh, so uh, they tried one method to eliminate them. They got them, for the most part, um, covered up, but we still weren't happy with the, with the finish. So they started uh, another process uh, today. Uh, I inspected the first coat. Uh, it seems to be working well. Uh, we'll be installing another coat and uh, weather permitting, and we should have the tennis courts open, ready for play for our tennis team, uh, the girls' tennis, on uh, Monday the 31st. Uh, we gave that deadline to the contractor. Um, at VHHS, our summer carpeting project uh, has been delayed um, for replacing the carpet uh, due to the construction delays. Um, so we're working. Um, uh, we obviously don't want to install the carpet too soon. Uh, since brand new carpet, we don't get it, want it ruined. Uh, so um, we're working to get that all done uh, in conjunction with the uh, addition uh, the work's going on the new construction over there at Vernon Hills. Um, at Vernon Hills, the classroom addition uh, has moved along. We've got furniture in, in some of the classrooms. Um, carpeting is down. Uh, they're doing some finishing touches. Um, we have a major delay. Uh, we just got, we're informed again that the delay in the science uh, classrooms would be the, the two science classrooms in a STEM lab. Uh, we're not expecting the materials till uh, close to the end of October. Um, so we'll be delayed in finishing those classrooms. Um, we will be, for the whole project, we will be walking through with the ROE on September 10th uh, as part of our annual life safety inspection. And at that point, we will uh, be looking to be granted um, temporary occupancy on the construction site. Um, to use classrooms that are available um, and anything that's, that's completed, uh, including the cafeteria. So in area B, um, the cafeteria equipment is installed. There's a couple uh, pieces of equipment. We're waiting, waiting for some additional parts. Um, the flooring down in the, in the um, new eating area is completed. Um, next step would be the carpet and the foyer in, in, in those spaces. Um, but the uh, pattern, the floor looks fantastic. Um, can't wait till you guys are able to walk through the building and, and get a glimpse of it. Um, so Ed, that's moving along. Um, and then um, the gym and dance studio is moving forward. Uh, they're working on vapor barrier on the outside, finishing up the roof, um, doing the HVAC, doing mechanicals and stuff inside, inside the building um, and moving forward with that. And we're looking at the same uh, completion, you know, substantial completion in October in, in that area. Uh, one last note is the village has started their water main, uh, water main project on Route 176. So um, they started, they gave us the initial schedule. So uh, they've already closed down Dawes as of today and they will be saw cutting and preparing uh, the surface so our main entrance at Liberty Hill High School uh, will be intermittently closed over the next two weeks as they do the work uh, there at Dawes. Then they're gonna move to uh, the west. Uh, the project will end down at, at Diamond. So um, they will do directional boring um, and move along the front of the, the high school property. Um, at no time will both entrances on Route 176 be closed. Uh, so. Once they're done at the main entrance, they'll move to the west um, and they'll temporarily close from time to time the uh, new pool entrance to the west. Um, we've opened up the gate through the east parking lot by the tennis courts, so staff um, is able to use that during the day, uh, staff and, and any students that come to the campus. Um, and that completes my report on construction. Great. Thanks, Mark. Mark, just one quick question. What, what materials are delayed on the STEM and science labs? Uh, would be all the cabinets, the cabinetry, and the countertops, and okay. 
in STEM labs and the science, yes. Manufacturing the mark from COVID? COVID, COVID related delays, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we had uh, five uh, FOIA requests and as required, I'll read those into the record. Uh, this FOIA was received on 728. The response deadline was 8-4. Uh, uh, requester Eric Chung, data acquisition specialist, Smart Procure. Uh, information requested, Smart Procure is submitting a public records request to the Adams um, Spec School District 128 for all current employee staff contact information. Uh, the request is limited to readily available records without physically copying, scanning, or printing paper documents. Any editable electronic document is acceptable. Specific information requested for your record keeping system is first name, last name, physician title, department, direct phone number. If does not exist, list main phone number with extension. Business cell phone, if provided by, um, let's keep saying Adams Special School District 128, uh, email address, office address, uh, address, city, state, and zip. Follow-up was done by Carol Scoden. Um, no responsive records uh, response sent 8320. Uh, FOIA requested on 728, deadline response 84. Requester Stephen uh, T. Duplain, uh, 400 Corporate Point Suite, Culver City, California. Information requested, this is an official request under the Illinois Freedom of Information Act. For the names, corresponding job titles, email addresses, and the most current and readily available salary information of all teachers and administrators employed at CHSD 128 as of the date of this request. Follow-up was done by Carol Scoden. Uh, request was fulfilled and response sent on 8-3-20. Uh, FOIA requested 717. Uh, commercial response deadline was 817. Kevin uh, DeLoian, uh, data acquisition specialist, Smart Procure. Uh, Smart Procure is submitting a commercial FOIA request to the Libertyville Vernon Hills Community High School District 128 for any and all purchasing records from 1230 uh, to 2019 to current. Request is limited to readily available records without physically copying, scanning, or printing paper, paper documents. Any editable electronic document is acceptable. The specific information requested from your record keeping system is one purchase order number. If purchase orders are not used, a comparable substitute is acceptable. Uh, two, purchase date. Three, line item details. Uh, detailed description of the purchase. Four, line item quantity. Five, line item price. Six, vendor ID. Number, name, address, contact person, and their email address. Follow-up is done by Dan Stanley and Rose DeSico. Request fulfilled and response sent on 8-6. 2020 time spent approximately one hour. FOIA request uh, received on 8-12, deadline 8-19 from Carolina Wiecek um, in Chicago. Information requested, please confirm that Vernon Hills High School is assigned to 226 US Highway 45, Indian Creek, Illinois 60061. Follow-up is done by Carol Scoden. Request was fulfilled and response was sent on 8-14. FOIA request received 812, response deadline 819 uh, from CBS Chicago, Michelle Youngerman, investigative producer, uh, 222 West Washington Street in Chicago. I'm requesting statistical staffing information related to district employees, either temporarily or permanently choosing to not return to school for any or all of the 2021-2021 school year. Um, more specifically, please provide the name, the number of employees by category, i.e. teacher assistant, teacher, substitute teacher, secretary, etc., along with their status or reason, i.e. opt out, resign, retired, medical leave, furloughed, etc., for not returning during any or all of the 2020-2021 school year. For example, 10 teachers on medical leave, uh, 12 substitutes opt out, two secretaries uh, resigned, etc., Please also provide the total number of substitute teachers available and ready to work as you begin the school year. Follow-up uh, request was received on 820 or 812. New clarification, apologies, but to be clear, this should also include the statistical breakdown of those employees who plan to opt out or not be at school for any other reason this coming year if school is going to have any in-person classes. 
Uh, Follow-up was done by Brian Kelly. A request was fulfilled and response was sent on 8-19-2020. Um, and just a couple of other things. Um, let me start with community education because um, uh, we had a public comment on that earlier and uh, Pat may mention of that again. Uh, we have a full adult uh, ongoing communication uh, education program in this district. Uh, we partner with um, Stevenson and other districts in the area to provide those classes. Those classes are generally very small in number. They will be in number. Um, anybody who's using our facilities or uh, facilities that may be out in the community uh, will be required to uh, follow appropriate PPE, temperature checks, face masks, uh, et cetera, social distancing. Um, so those classes will continue um, uh, as we move uh, in, into the semester. And again, we have no uh, concerns because the, um, uh, the controlled size uh, of those classes. Uh, secondly, um, just to um, follow up on something that we've talked about to the board, um, I think on July 10th and then on the 22nd, uh, the night we made the decision and that we talked about in every meeting since then that we are continuing to, continuing to move forward uh, with our planning for bringing smaller groups of students uh, back uh, to the district as we're able to do that. Uh, as has been noted this evening already, we have athletics, drumline, band camp, Driver's education has already started. Both schools did freshman orientation, um, school supply pickup and exchanges, and the SAT uh, national test will be held at um, Vernon Hills upcoming. In addition to that, in um, uh, future weeks, uh, we'll be looking at uh, groups of English learners, uh, lifeguarding, career tech education classes for select courses, supervised e-school, workspaces, uh, LST, social emotional support groups, pause, fine arts, um, curricular and extracurricular. Um, and then uh, as we continue to move forward, uh, testing programs, SAT and S ACT for students, special education, academic support, academic enrichment experiences and senior class, college post-secondary planning. So um, although our planning isn't finalized on that, we've broken those down into groups. Um, we generally have them in timelines right now. We've got a little bit more work to do on that, uh, but we will continue to move forward um, uh, as we're able to do in terms of bringing smaller groups back in. And finally tonight, um, over a period of a couple of weeks, um, the board and the administration was asked uh, several questions around uh, um, driver's education, uh, physical welfare, um, or physical education, what we call physical uh, welfare. Uh, questions and we post some of those questions to uh, council. We knew the answers to them, but we wanted to be clear uh, that we had council look at them too. Um, the first question revolved around um, the fact that the gov governor issued an executive order last spring, uh, which would waive uh, or suspend the PE requirement for 2020. That was to make sure that seniors were not denied graduation uh, for not being able to finish a PE class. Uh, particularly in school districts that did not have the wherewithal to be able to do um, remote learning, and there were a number of those. Um, the governor extended that order uh, through August 22nd in order to pick up summer school kids. Uh, therefore, the suspension of the PE requirement does not apply for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, secondly, there was a question uh, that uh, revolved around uh, the number of PE classes that students had to take over four years that students uh, should be required to take uh, physical welfare uh, defined physical education class in addition to driver's education um, and uh, health. So for example, in the sophomore year, um, the position posited was that you would have to take driver's ed and a physical education class that semester or you would have to take health as a freshman and a physical education class. Uh, as a number of high schools do in the Chicago area, um, physical education, uh, physical welfare department includes driver's ed and health. So they count as PE classes and there's nothing in the school code that precludes a school from counting driver's education as their PE class in the semester that they take that. Number of schools do that um, and we also do that as well. The third question revolved uh, around, uh, I think, um, you know, possibly more of an assertion um, that um, 
the dist our district is allowing students to opt out of physical education um, in lieu of athletics uh, in grades 10 through 12, and it should only be grades 11 through 12. So just let me read uh, something for you uh, that's uh, covered in the Illinois school code. The school board is authorized to excuse pupils enrolled in grades 11 and 12 from engaging in physical education courses if those pupils request to be excused for any of the following reasons. One, ongoing participation in interscholastic inter athletic program. A school board may also, on a case-by-case -case basis, excuse pupils in grades 7 through 12 who participate in an interscholastic or extracurricular athletic program from engaging in physical education courses. And our practice in this district, per this policy, has been to allow uh, 10th graders to uh, apply for a PE waiver only during the season that they are participating in sports. So uh, school code allows for that and lines up with our policy. So those are the answers to the three physical education questions that have been posed uh, to the board and administration um, over the last few weeks. And uh, Pat, believe it or not, I think that concludes the superintendent's report tonight. Okay, thanks, uh, great job. All right, next um, is the approval of the consent vote agenda, which is listed. Uh, again, we reviewed this earlier in the month. Um, if I could have a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed, please. So I move so. to approve the uh, consent vote agenda. All right, is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All right, if not, roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Grudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Uh, and actually, I, I forgot to do this before we uh, did it. For all the students, the rest of the meeting is very routine. Oh, yeah. um, probably, you, first of all, you are welcome to stay for any and all of it. Um, but this is also the part of the meeting that you're also welcome to say you have more important and pressing things to do um, with respect to homework or whatever other things you got to do. So if you want to stay, you're welcome to. But if you want to sign off, uh, you're more than welcome to do that as well. OK. And again, thanks for all your great contributions tonight. OK, next program and personnel committee. Chairperson Batson. OK, Dr. Grudy, thank you. Uh, we have uh, the first on the agenda is the second reading and adoption for a group of board policies, a group of six board policies. These have been reviewed uh, twice in committee and uh, uh, reviewed last month at the board meeting for a first reading. So we have these board policies. Uh, can we have a, a motion, please? I move to adopt the uh, board policies uh, after the second reading um, as listed. Second. Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments? Nope. I think we've seen these quite a few times. So uh, roll call, please. Rudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Our second item on the uh, program and personnel agenda is employment of employees. We have one administrative staff annual revised contract. Uh, I think it's uh, self-explanatory, but can we have a motion, please? I motion to accept the employment of the employee as listed. Second. Uh, any further questions, discussion? Can we just get clarification? What was the uh, re revision to the contract? Yeah, so her original contract when it was made, she was at, um, so our, our team leaders are paid off of the teacher salary schedule. So she was at master's plus 30. And she moved over this summer to master's plus 45. So okay. Okay. we have Thanks. to revise um, her contract. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Can we have a roll call, please? Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. 
Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Grudy. Aye. Okay, that motion passes. Is there anything uh, anyone has for other under the PMP? Okay, hearing none, I will pass it back to you, Dr. Grudy. Okay, thank you. Facilities and Finance, uh, Chairperson Huber. All right, I'll turn it over to our Assistant Superintendent of Finance. Dan, I think we got some spending per pupil to go over. Yes. <clears throat> um, do you have, do you guys, can you guys see that site-based reporting report? Um, in your packet? It's a two pager. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to scroll. Find the right one. I think Carol got it out there for us. It's a two pager. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a it, one pager. Right, yeah. Okay, I forgot. I forgot I wrote a cumber memo. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so every year for the last two years, um, the national. Um, federal law every student succeeds act that was that was the law that replaced uh, no child left behind and part of that was the requirement for school districts to report so school districts have always reported their expenditures as a per pupil uh, operating expenditure um, but we've never had we've never been we've never been required to do that per school it's always been a, on a district level so if you have one school uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you have multiple schools in your district, it's not always clear uh, how much you spend per kid. So, for instance, if you spend twenty thousand dollars on average, maybe you spend forty thousand at one school, and then, well, I guess zero technically at the other one. But you you get what I mean. So we have to re report our expenditures uh, on a per site. So it's for us, it's the two high schools, and so you know we use our general our ledger uh, for our expenditures and. Is be as well aware that none of this is audited. All of this is just taken from our GL and is, you know, not going to be necessarily audit accurate, but it's going to give you a sense of what's happening. So last year we reported uh, that for the first time based on fiscal year 19. Now we have to report that based on fiscal year 20. And so, you know, I, I plug those numbers in and I see what the math uh, generates out. And then I look at that and then I try to understand what the difference is. Um, you're, you're probably never going to be exact, but I, I think it's helpful to understand where it's different. So we had a difference last year. We explained that. Now we have a difference this year um, to explain. So um, we had $24,300 at LHS per student and $23,769 per student at Vernon Hills. Um, so that's a $538 per difference. Now, last year we had a $400, it was $400 higher at Vernon Hills um, than it was at LHS per student. Now it's, now it's swung the other way. So what is going into this? So when I break down um, our expenditures and look at the differences per kid, um, I, I look at the areas and find where I see significant differences. And these are the three areas really that I see that go into why we are different. Um, so the first difference that makes up about 50, $57 per kid is substitute teachers. Uh, before the pandemic hit, we just had more subs at LHS than we did at Vernon Hills. Um, and also uh, LHS had, before the pandemic hit, because once the pandemic hit, kind of everything, a lot of things really shut down in terms of purchases. Uh, at that point in the year, LHS had purchased more supplies and equipment per kid. Than Vernon Hills did. Um, and then the other different, the rest of it really, which is really the biggest difference is um, the teacher's salary and benefits. Um, so um, I started looking in, I started, you know, digging into some of those details um, because it, that was not a difference that really presented itself last year, um, but it is something that is sticking out this year. And so what I was able to deduce from looking at it and trying to compare is um, the LHS staff overall uh, is older um, and more experienced than the staff on average at, at, at Vernon Hills. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the average age of the teachers, they're 44 at LHS, 41 at Vernon Hills, which is not a big difference, but it's part of, it's part of the reason why, it's, it's mathematically part of the reason why they're different. 
uh, for example, the percentage of teachers that are either on longevity or the retirement track, which goes to a little bit more of experience in the district. 39% uh, of the teachers at LHS are in that category versus 33% at Vernon Hills. And uh, a third example of that is looking at lanes. So if you take the, the percentage of teachers that are equal than or greater than, equal to or greater than, greater than or equal to, sorry if I'm saying it backwards, uh, a, a, a lane that's a master's 15 or higher, 74% of the staff at LHS are at or above the MA15 versus 53% at Vernon Hills. Uh, so that is that those numbers, the longevity, uh, the lane change, all that stuff goes into the salaries of those teachers. And that is why um, it's higher. It, it is not because there is something off between like teachers per kids. Um, those were almost dead on. And that again speaks to, you know, the staffing process we go to. Um, it was, it's extremely comparable, um, but it's just the salaries of those that end up um, getting paid there. So, you know, you have a fair number of new teachers at Vernon Hills, for instance, you get out, and especially when you have like, for example, counselors, um, there's a big difference in the, essentially the, the, the salaries of the counselors at Vernon Hills versus LHS because we got some new ones, you know, um, versus others retired. So those are really the differences that I'm seeing in uh, that go into that $500 difference. So that's the site-based reporting. It's nothing you have to uh, approve on or anything, but it is something that we have to publicly report that is part of our report card, as, as well as the narrative that goes with that. Um, so it figured it's always better for you to be aware of what's going on. So that's what I have for that. Dan, just one question. What, any, any thoughts on why we have twice as many subs at LHS? When we have um, about 20% difference in students, maybe? Uh, no, it, well, it's a, it's a per, so that, yeah, um, why we had more subs, I don't know that I could tell you that right now. I, I don't know. And, and I didn't, I didn't really ask Brian for what, why the more subs, it, it could be a variety of reasons, you know, it could be related to people on different leaves or, or whatever. I, I don't know. And I, I don't want to speculate without having that data. So okay. I, I don't, I don't know that answer. Okay. Other questions for Dan? Yeah, I, I do have that one question. So that relationship of the teacher salaries, 446, that had to be probably consistent. That like that didn't change year over year. So I would suspect if I looked at this last year, it would have been about the same. But you said Vernon Hills actually was higher than Libertyville last year by a lot. Like, didn't you it, say like four or five hundred bucks? It was. And when it, you have to take the dollars that you actually spend and then divide it by the number of kids. Last year, based on the number of kids at each school, it did not stick out to me the experience of the 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 teacher salary difference. What stuck out stood out to me was the building administration. Like we talked about, you know, the you have the same number of principal for or the same you have a like one principal for example for uh, the you know fifteen hundred kids versus nineteen hundred kids as an example. So your dollar per your, your principal dollars per kid is higher at that building. That stood out of the data last year. This year, that did not stick out of the data, probably because LHS was down a little bit and Vernon Hills was up a little bit. And so that, that dollar difference did not stick out like it did last year. Um, so I, you know, without, without like probably digging into it a whole lot more, that's, that's all I can tell you is in terms of when I, I looked at the per dollar differences in all of our functions and objects and stuff like that, uh, that did not stick out last year, but it does, it does this year. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. These differences are, again, it's, I'm sure they're going to fluctuate based upon as Vernon Hills gets more kids, it's going to be a more interesting analysis. The final question I have on this one is how does it compare? We do present a schedule in the CAFR every year. It actually has per pupil spending. Is this, I think it should be, if I remember right, I last looked at it a couple of years ago, but I thought we were in the 22, 23 range. So this, doesn't seem out of that. Did that go up? I haven't looked at it for a year. Uh, no, we're about 23 range, but it, it in theory would go up. I mean, if you're spending more the year before, it'll go up a little bit. But that calculation, like they don't take in the, the exact same numbers into account. So there are things excluded from this. For example, we don't count the the $30 million additions that we're doing at, at Vernon Hills. Like we, we don't, that's not part of the calculation. 
because it's apples and oranges. So each calculation takes out and includes a few different things than the other. So they don't use the exact same. It's a little bit apples to oranges, but yeah, we're in that 23 to $24,000 range. Um, okay, great. That's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions on this report? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move to the CARES Act. You want to, I think it's CARES Act next, Cass? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. CARES Act. So um, with the CARES Act, there is money that we uh, believe that we might have access to through the state um, that I'm working on. But in addition, there is money I mentioned earlier in the budget hearing that um, the Lake County Board, so the County Government Board um, has decided, I, I'm honestly not sure if they're required to, I'm guessing they're not required to, but I could be wrong. Um, they are sharing some of the CARES Act money that they received at the county level. Um, they're sharing that with the taxing districts uh, and school districts. And so they have allocated the money on a per student basis. And so we, um, we have access to uh, a very specific amount of money. Carol, do you remember it was 104? Uh, 104006 or something like that. It was like 104,000. Like 104, yeah, that we can get reimbursed for. And so what the county is asking in order for us to access that money. So for example, the money through the state, like the board doesn't have to do anything. We can just apply for it. But this, they're asking for an intergovernmental agreement. And that's the thing that really the board has to enter into. Um, and so th that's why this is really here for you, for you to approve. And I didn't have it before, um, but, but I do have it now. Our attorney reviewed it, said there's nothing wrong with this. Um, and so our intention would be, is that we would submit for reimbursement the thermal scanners that we spent, um, that was about $112,000 that we would use towards this. And I think this, the one stipulation is you can't double dip, meaning I couldn't get reimbursed for this and then also ask the state to reimburse me for the thermal scanners too. You know what I mean? You have to keep them separate. So that that would be my plan for, for this money. So um, I think it's great, it's cool. It seems pretty straightforward and uh, yeah, I honestly, I, I was I was a very surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear this. This is, I think, a really cool thing. So, All right, other questions for Dan regarding the intergovernmental agreement between Lake County and uh, 128. All right, seeing none, may I, may, may I have a motion to accept the intergovernmental agreement as presented between Lake County and Community High School District 128? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Carol. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. All right, thank you for that. It looks like we're going to start doing some turf in the softball field. Finally, we, is this the is this the next topic, Dan? I believe so. Yes, Mark. All right, yep. Mark. Okay. Um, yes, this is uh, the next topic. Is um, this is a source wall uh, bid contract? Um, so that this is uh, um, we've used it in the past as we call it a co-op. Um, they're part of a co-op um, and the prices are bid nationally and that since they're bid nationally it allows us to to use that pricing uh, to purchase materials and service. Um, we did we've used um, the field turf product in the same way we did uh, Brainerd and when uh, we did the uh, replace the varsity uh, field at the stadium uh, at Libertyville a few years ago we use the same process as, as this, uh, um, going through co-op. Um, so uh, we have a um, total cost for uh, the synthetic turf, uh, final grading and in, in installation um, for the project, $117,357. Um, and the product is field turf. And forgive me, you might have mentioned this, but 
There's also site work that would have to happen that is an addition that we're, we're still working on. This is just to provide the turf. So this is not the cost of the whole project. That was, my, is, that was my question. What do, we, what do we estimate the total cost of the project will be? It was like 330. Hmm. Three, I think it was 361, if I remember. Come, let me pull it up right now. It was closer to 350, Dan, I think. Is yeah, that... I, I believe it was 361 was our estimated cost um, for the whole project. Um, so we're looking to approve this now so we get it in the queue uh, for production. Um, as a sidebar, an update on the project itself, we had a pre-bidding pre-bid meeting uh, last Thursday. We had 10 contractors show up. So we are looking for very competitive bidding. Uh, we will have a bid opening on um, September 8th, and then we will bring it for board approval for the site work and all that um, at your special board meeting on the 14th of September. And Mark, I know we've talked about this. Um, I feel like we've been talking about this for a long time and at one point did decide to put it off. Could you just review why this needs to be done? Um, we've been having, uh, over the years, it's been the same issue that they had with the boys baseball field. Um, even though it is up in a higher part of the property, uh, it just does not drain. Uh, it's also, uh, um, shadowed by the, the um, stadium bleachers. So we actually don't get sun on the softball field to dry it out till about midday. Um, so there's been, we spent a lot of uh, time and effort trying to, to make the field playable and we have to cancel a lot of things or, you know, spend some extra money um, trying to make the field playable uh, to get the games in. So this is a solution for the drainage issue and, and the things that, the site conditions that we have there. So that site work is going to address the, the drainage issue and yes. then the to replace the old turf that's been there for about how long? Well, this so is a clay, it's a clay yeah. infield. It's not, there's not a turf there now. The base, the baseball field was, had the same issues and they put a turf infield in there several years ago. It was before I came to the district. So about 10 years ago, eight to 10 okay. years ago, they put Thank you. I wanted to make sure we, we resummarize. Thanks. Yeah, just and just a little brief history lesson on that. So in the spring, we way back in probably February or so is when we presented this list. And as we progressed in the spring a little bit, it did come up at one of our meetings to talk about like, you know, with everything going on, like, is this really, is this what our projects, are there projects that we should be putting on hold? Is this really a project that we should consider? And at that time, uh, I, I would say what I said then as well, that th there would be many, many other places that I would pause or slow down before I would do this. This, this project um, was by and far away the most, the top priority project at Vernon Hills, bigger than any other request for projects done. And so um, I, I would say the same thing I said then is, is this would not be a project that I would recommend us slowing down on. There's many other places that if we wanted to, hold off on something, I, I would suggest we do that before we would look at affecting this project. So uh, part, of the, part of the long view history, Lisa, to your question is when they built Vernon Hills, they had to make some reductions uh, because they ran out of money with the referendum, which often happens. So the cafeteria is the size it is, that was a reduction. Um, uh, one of the external buildings uh, that could have been added a second gym uh, was not done and there was uh, no drainage uh, put a, up on the athletic field. So uh, that price has been paid over a period of time uh, as folks have talked about with inability to play contests in the spring, particularly coming out of a bad winter and a wet spring. So that's just a, maybe a little broader uh, history in that particular area. All right, other questions regarding the uh, a portion, I should say, of the Vernon Hills softball, high school softball field. All right, seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the contract for the artificial turf as presented? So um, moved. I have a second, please. Second. Thank you. All right, Lisa. Any other comments? Uh, seeing none, Carol, you want to call it? Lundstead. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. 
Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Grudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. All right, so that one passes. I look forward to seeing the other $244,000 coming later on. Uh, if disposal of IT equipment or of equipment, really IT, I think that was a 76 pager. That could have been one of the bigger ones I've seen. Dan? Uh, yeah, so uh, Mick likes to do this a few times a year and with the pandemic hitting, he uh, did not do it during one of his times. So he's got that much more to dispose of this time. Uh, so it is, it is a very large disposal, um, which he is aware of, and he is very uh, excited to dispose of these items. Um, so yeah, this is, yeah, this is that list. Um, I believe this is a group that we've used before um, last time. So uh, yeah, this, this did not, we did not have this for the committee meeting. So that's why it's on here uh, now. We, so we did not have this at committee, but we have it now, so. All right, anybody have any questions? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Uh, about 25 of those pages in that document were the certificates uh, showing that uh, they were compliant with um, EPA regulations for disposal, and I was pleased to see that. Yeah, yeah. Very, it was yeah, very good. I think Mick, uh, I think Mick tries to take that very seriously, you know, and, and um, so he, he, uh, he, I think he does a great job of trying to make sure all that stuff is done carefully. And if I could just also mention, I really appreciated the detail, even though it was 76 pages to go through, um, the summary of his report did uh, verify that none of that could be donated as we have done um, in the past several times and in the recent past. Um, I know that Mick would have done that if any of this was usable, which the report details um, the equipment was not. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Lisa. That's true. That's very true. Other, other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we, can we have board approval to scrap the equipment from the attached inventory list as presented? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thanks, Jim. All right. Carol? Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Grudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. All right. That one went through. Do we have any other for the facilities and finance for our Mr. Stanley or anybody else? Mark, press, oh, okay, Pat, back to you, thanks. Okay, um, I believe that is everything, correct? No CEDAW, no ISB, right? Okay, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Grudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Aye. All right, motion carries. Uh, that's it. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Good night, Good night. Good night everybody.